Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel, The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopez, as always. And today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Graziano. He is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Princeton University. His scientific research focuses on the brain basis of awareness. He has proposed the attention schema theory and has an explanation of how and for what adaptive, adaptive advantage sorry, brains attribute the property of awareness to themselves. He is also the author of 13 books, including Consciousness and the Social Brain and The Spaces Between Us, a story of neuroscience, evolution and human nature. So, Dr. Graziano, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so let's see. The first question I would like to ask you is, uh, and I mean, I want to ask you this because uh, all of us experience consciousness. And so I guess that everyone thinks that they know what consciousness is about. But I guess that most of what comes from science is most of the time very unintuitive. So I would like to ask you from a scientific perspective, what is consciousness? Well, that's debated, of course. And yes, I think that everyone is a user of consciousness, but science wants to get under the hood and sure. see what's going on uh, underneath the surface. Uh, and that's not at all obvious to um, casual users of consciousness. So there's a lot of debate as to what it is, and there's a lot of different uh, points of view, but I think there's kind of a growing scientific consensus that uh, the brain is an information processing device. About a hundred years of research seems to show that the, that's what the brain does. It's, it it uh, takes in information, processes it, and everything we believe about ourselves, everything we know about ourselves, derives from information constructed in the brain. And our notions about consciousness are basically self-descriptions. They're often a little bit simplified. They're uh, kind of schematic self-descriptions. But what we're looking at is a device that self-describes. And uh, that's probably what's going on with respect to what people kind of loosely call uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will get more specifically into things like attention and awareness, which are other parts of your work and I think are also related to consciousness. But would you say that uh, consciousness is not uh, a single entity operating uh, in the brain, but it is composed of several different uh, cognitive components, perhaps? Well, again... Uh, there's a lot of debate, but in this case, part of the debate has to do with uh, different definitions of the word. People definitely use that word in different ways. Uh, for many people, consciousness refers to all the different stuff going on in your head. And there's a lot of different kinds of things going on in there. Um, there's memory, and there's perception, and there's emotions and thinking, and all these different components. Uh, and this view of consciousness, this kind of stream of consciousness view, uh, emphasizes the content, what's actually in your consciousness. But there's another approach that is more prevalent today in uh, philosophy and science. And that is to say, essentially, never mind the content, never mind the stuff that's in consciousness. How do you get to be conscious of it? You know, what is it that allows you to have a subjective experience of anything at all, whether it's a memory or a thought or an emotion or a visual perception? And in that sense, you could say there is one thing, one consciousness thing, uh, uh, this kind of mystery of how you can attach subjective experience to these other uh, pieces of mental content. So it depends on how you look at it. In some ways, really consciousness is a unified question um, and it's a question of something that relates to the vast range of stuff going on in in your head at any one time 
Mm -hmm. Yes, but to better understand how consciousness works, uh, is it also important for us to understand, uh, I'm not sure if it's correct to call them lower cognitive processes, but for example, you refer to things like perception and you also studied perception a lot. So would you say that perhaps as knowing a little bit more about how uh, cognitive uh, operations like perception work, uh, also allow us to better understand how then processes like consciousness get built up from that, maybe. Right. A lot of people have taken that approach, and that's especially true with visual perception, because so much is known about visual perception. Uh, the many the incredible amount of details about how the human brain builds up a visual picture of the world. Uh, I would say that has not, in general, given a lot of insight into consciousness. That's told us how a machine can take in and process information about the visual world. Uh, and it turns out that, although that's very complicated, it's something engineers can get a handle on. We now have computers that can do this very well. Uh, many of these, I guess you might call them lower level functions, although they're very complicated, they're actually quite high level in a way, but functions like vision, or memory. Uh, these are things that we know how to build into machines now, uh, but that has not given us any handle at all on uh, what consciousness itself is. Right? You can build a machine that has a pretty good memory of its own past, has lots of information about its own autobiography, so to speak. You can build a machine with a camera that sees and uh, parcels out and, un and uh, processes the visual world. But nobody yet, yet knows how to build a machine that says, oh, and I have a conscious experience of it. So that part seems to be something uh, separate from these um, other uh, specific components. And I think, although people have tried, I think people have not made a lot of progress studying consciousness by focusing on perception in particular or memory in particular. Mm -hmm. And what is the, important, the importance of attention for this discussion? I mean, is it important for us to understand how we perhaps pay attention to certain very specific pieces of information and hold them in our minds consciously uh, and exclude most of what happens in the world? Yeah, uh, this I think probably is very relevant. And many people have noted along the way there's a, a really tight correlation between what your brain is uh, focusing its resources on and what you're conscious of. Uh, in fact, the correlation is so tight that for a long time people thought that was the same thing. It turns out it's not. You can't actually break those two apart. Uh, but most of the time, your brain is not processing all possible signals. It can't. There's just too much going on in the world. Uh, but the things that your brain is deploying its resources on, those are the things that you say you're conscious of almost all the time. There's a, a few cases in laboratory conditions where you can show the brain is focusing on something, but the person says they're not aware of it. You can separate those two, but it takes a bit of work. Most of the time, attention uh, in the sense of uh, of focusing of resources, of our of processing resources, that kind of attention uh, and what we say we're conscious of are right uh, uh, with each other. They're, um, they're linked in some way. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, there are a lot of processes that go around in our brains all of the time that, are, that operate at a subconscious yeah. level. So, I mean, when you're talking about attention and perhaps brains directing some of, it, some of their resources to some very specific pieces of information. Uh, are you saying that when we, when we are paying attention to something, uh, uh, there are parts of our brains that are focused on that, but at the same time, other parts are processing other pieces of information that we are not uh, paying attention to? Yes. Uh, there's an enormous amount of stuff going on up there that we're not attending to and that we're not aware of. This is an incredible amount of maybe only a few percent or less of what's going on up in there is anything that we know about explicitly or, or uh, claim to be conscious of. 
it seems to be attention in the sense of a machine that's focusing resources, that kind of attention has layers. And uh, you can have some of that at a low level, but as you ascend to higher layers, there's a kind of winnowing process and fewer and fewer items are being processed in greater and greater depth. And it seems to be the highest levels of that winnowing process. The items that are really processed in, in great depth and probably processed by networks in the cerebral cortex that span large uh, parts of the cerebral cortex. Uh, it's um, those networks essentially seizing on a very limited set of items, a, a limited set of signals and processing them in tremendous depth so that we can react to them and understand them in, in great detail. That seems to be kind of the highest level of attention, which is very closely associated with what we report as, as consciousness. Those two are uh, bound together in some way. Mm -hmm. So uh, is, is there a two-way street in terms of feedback between what happens consciously and what is happening subconsciously? And I mean, perhaps things that happen, uh, information that we process consciously might also influence uh, lower processes? Probably, yes. But I think there's, you know, a lot that's not known uh, about that. But uh, certainly unconscious processing uh, seems to flow upward <laughs> into the uh, highest levels of attention and what we would call consciousness. There's probably a lot of flow backward as well that's uh, filtering and affecting these lower level processes. It's probably a, a two-way street, sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, just for people to get a better grasp of the concepts, uh, what is the relationship between attention and awareness? Well, I have a particular way of thinking about that. And um, that's kind of at the heart of this uh, theory that my lab has been working on for uh, several years now. And many people have noted that attention and awareness are related somehow, right? They're, they usually uh, track each other, although they can be broken apart uh, in, in uh, special circumstances. Um, what we've uh, come to is this realization, attention is something the brain does. It's a mechanistic process. You can build a machine that can pay attention, and people have built machines that focus their resources on this or on that and uh, control where that focus of attention goes. Attention is something the brain does. Awareness is something the brain says that it has. It's a self-description. Uh, and we think very simply what we call awareness, when we say we're aware of something and we talk about what that means to be aware, it's the brain's self-description of what it means to pay attention. So not only does the brain do attention, it also describes to itself what it's doing. And uh, that self-description is what we report as consciousness. And this is why usually our conscious awareness, our subjective awareness, tracks our attention pretty well. But the brain can make mistakes, and so sometimes you can separate those two. But this is what we think is going on, that awareness is a kind of uh, schematic or a simplified way that the brain understands what it's doing when it's paying attention to things. Mm -hmm. Very well. And what is the difference between awareness and consciousness? I mean, is it relevant to this question to know that there's a difference between being aware and knowing that you are aware, even though it might seem very strange to most people that there's a difference between these two things? Right. So. Because people use these words in so many different ways, uh, you will find people who say awareness and consciousness are the same thing. They're just interchangeable, uh, depending on how you define the words. Other people will say, no, I define them so that awareness is this thing and consciousness is this a bigger thing. And uh, even in my own writing, I've used them in different ways. But the trick is, uh, when, whenever you write a, something, an article, a book, or whatever, it's really useful to start by saying, in, in this book, I hereby use this word this way and that word that way. 
And so sometimes, uh, as I said, awareness and consciousness are conflated. People use them interchangeably. Uh, I tend to use awareness to mean the subjective, what, what we report as a subjective experience this sort of basic subjective experience, whether it's uh, our experience of a, of a, a visual image or an emotion or a thought, whatever it is. That's how I usually use awareness. Uh, consciousness I usually use to mean uh, much more inclusive, not just the subjective component, but also the content you are aware of. So all the stuff in your head at any one time uh, but you know, pe people use these words in different ways. I think you're specifically referring to a kind of what sometimes people call metacognition. So you can be aware or if we want conscious of something, but you can also have a, a cognitive kind of intellectual thought. Oh, I am aware of that thing. And that I certainly think is a separate layer on top. It's a cognitive layer on top. And, you know, people have that. I don't know if other animals have that, but that's a specialized thing. Uh, and the, the question I'm most interested in, or at least my lab has been focused on, is that lower level. This, how do we get that uh, subjective experience? Why, why are we machines that go around um, insisting we have a subjective experience of anything at all? Mm -hmm. Yes, so I mean it's like metacognition, like the difference between what we know and what we know that we know. Right? Sure, something yeah. like that. Yes, sometimes those two are separate from each other. Uh, to give you one of my favorite examples, of the, so the brain constructs these very low-level, basic, automatic models, and we can't help them. Uh, we there's nothing we can do to stop it, and. One of the best studied examples is in the visual system, the brain constructs a, um, a, a description of white, white light as pure luminance without any color. And uh, that's what our brains do. That's millions of years of evolution have given us that description and we're stuck with it. But intellectually, if anyone has gone to school, <laughs> they know that's actually not true and white light is made up of uh, all colors in the visible spectrum sort of mushed together. And so there's a case where you have a lower level um, construct of the brain, which we're stuck with and we can't alter. And we have a higher level uh, cognitive knowledge, which is totally in opposition to it. And the two exist at the same time. Most people have gotten used to that. They're perfectly okay with it. Uh, but our, our higher level cognitive knowledge does not always match those uh, lower level um, kind of perceptual models that the brain constructs. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's very interesting because we know from our studies on, on perception that the representations we make in our minds of uh, things that we receive through our eyes, for example, now talking about visual perception, that uh, our representations uh, don't really have a one-to-one -one correspondence with things outside in the world. I mean, they are kind of uh, construct constructions that our uh, brain creates just for us to deal approximately with the world around us. So uh, there's that thing. Would you say that perhaps it would be possible that uh, the way uh, we represent things consciously doesn't really correspond to other processes that happen in our brains that we're, that we're not uh, directly exposed to, let's say. Yes, of course. There's uh, this huge disconnect between uh, the way the brain describes the world and itself and the literal reality. And, you know, science is slowly trying to figure out what that literal reality is, but it's clear that it's different <laughs> from the kind of uh, uh, quick and dirty, uh, simplified uh, simulations that the brain constructs. Um, so the brain constructs models or bundles of information that describe things in its world. That's how it monitors and predicts and keeps track of its world. Uh, it builds models of itself, too. And these models are never accurate. They're never uh, um, really detailed and scientifically accurate. 
and and the reason's obvious. Uh, if you uh, if you are in a jungle and run into a tiger, as happens, I suppose, <laughs> and you start building a really detailed scientific understanding, you know, uh, pulling up the, your intellectual knowledge of tigers, you die, right? It takes too long. But if your brain can construct a really quick and dirty uh, a description or model of what's going on and what you should do, it's got to be fast. It can't. You don't have time for accuracy. You just have to be good enough for the circumstance. Then you can run. Then you have at least a better chance of surviving the tiger. So uh, the, the survival pressure, evolutionary pressure, has led the brain to give us a picture or simulation of the world which is fundamentally simplified and uh, and quick and dirty, not really scientifically accurate. And that's our understanding. That's our, our picture of ourselves and our picture of the world around us uh, suffers that same kind of uh, inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's interesting that you just referred to evolutionary processes because this is a very big topic on my channel and one of, uh, of interest to me and to my audience. So I've been having quite a lot of people who apply evolutionary theory to all sorts of things like psychology, anthropology, biology, of course. So what would you say uh, was the evolutionary relevance of consciousness? And I'm... I I don't want to limit the discussion here to humans because probably other animals also experience consciousness at least to a certain degree, I would say. Right. So we think uh, on the basis of this theory that we've been trying to develop, this uh, really this um, overarching perspective, I guess you could say, that we've been developing, we think that it's very important for the brain to... Uh, monitor and make predictions about itself and about other uh, agents in the world that are controlled by brains. Uh, it, um, so if I look at someone else and want to predict their behavior, I need some kind of useful but simplified way of thinking about their brain and what it's doing and how it's controlling their behavior. And I need the same thing with respect to myself if I want to uh, uh, extrapolate my own behavior into the near future in seconds or minutes or hours into the future so that I can make useful plans for myself. I need to have some way of monitoring and predicting my own internal processes. And we think essentially this is where these um, ideas, these constructs of consciousness come from. So if I want to understand you and I want to predict your behavior, uh, I'm not going to uh, say to myself, okay, this is a biological machine, it's got a brain, it has 86 billion neurons, let's see if I can think of how the neurons hook to each other and then that causes this and then the speech comes out of the mouth. No, what I do is I build a much simpler concept that you're a, an agent, you have a consciousness thing inside you, it understands stuff and it causes you to act. And that's a very simple a model that can be used to help monitor and model and make predictions about you. And we think we do the same thing with respect to ourselves. And this is so useful that it, we suspect it comes in um, fairly early in evolution, right? Uh, you see this um, ability, at least social ability, to look at and predict the behavior of others. I mean, you find that in pretty much all mammals, you find that widespread in birds. And the last common ancestor of animals and birds was, I don't know, 350 million years ago or something like that. So this kind of thing may have come in quite early uh, and be slowly uh, elaborating over evolutionary time. Mm -hmm. Yes, but uh, that what you just described is a theory of mind, right? Yeah. That, I that is uh, me knowing that I have a mind and that yeah. other beings that at least exhibit behavior similar to mind also have minds and yeah. using that to predict my own behavior and also other people's behavior. But, but uh, th that is not uh, exactly conscious or it is a component of consciousness. Right. So uh, when people study theory of mind, very often what they study is 
how do I know what is in your mind? Like, do I realize that you know this or realize that, right? But there's a kind of baseline component to theory of mind. Uh, for me to have a good theory of your mind, I need to know that you have a mind. And I need to know what a mind is and what the basic uh, sort of groundwork rules of a mind are. And so what I need is an understanding that there is such a thing as consciousness. It has this, that, and this kind of general property. And you have it, right? So I'm attributing consciousness to you so that I can better understand you and what you may or may not know. Uh, and essentially what we're suggesting is we do the same thing to ourselves. We're attributing consciousness to ourselves. We're saying uh, the brain is essentially... Uh, saying, well, I got to understand myself. I got to make predictions about myself. So uh, let's say that I have a consciousness thing in me and it has this and that property and it can take in information and information becomes vivid when it takes it in. And I, then I can choose to react uh, to that specific information. Uh, so in a sense, we're building constructs and attributing properties to ourselves and to others. Uh, and yes, at the root of it, this is um, a, a, a part of theory of mind. It's, a, it's, a, it's the crucial foundational part of theory of mind that uh, there is that we, we view the world as though there is this kind of magic substance inside heads <laughs> that activates bodies. And that's a, a simple, quick and dirty way to understand ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is perhaps a very complicated question, but since it seems that consciousness might have played a very important role in our sociality, that is, in our establish, establishing social relationships with other people and promoting cooperation and things like that, uh, so there's that thing. But on the other hand, uh, it's also true that, for example, there are other animals, particularly certain insects, that are even more uh, you social than we are, yeah. and they don't really seem to need to be that conscious, uh, yeah. I guess. Right. I, I would presume not. I think they solve the problem in a different way. Um, I think we are brains of enormous complexity that can plan and that have very, very rich behavior. And so my task as a so social being is to try to make predictions about the incredibly complicated behavior coming out of you or someone else. And I can't do that unless I have a, uh, a, a model of a mind that's up to the task, up to that kind of sophistication. So I need a very rich model of, of what a mind is in order to make predictions about your very rich behavior. Insects don't have the same circumstance, right? Their behavior is not that complicated individually, right? Uh, so one insect doesn't have to go through great lengths to understand, to invent motivations, <laughs> to understand the rich complexity and choices of the other insect. At that level, they're actually very simple creatures. It's only the aggregate, the sort of whole colony of them together that starts exhibiting very complex uh, organized behavior. So there's the insects have found a different solution <laughs> to these uh, complicated social structures uh, that I, I'm pretty sure does not require a, a theory of mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and since we're now talking at the social level, let's say, would you say that perhaps there are components of consciousness that we could uh, talk about them as operating at the social level? I mean, is there such a, th uh, such a thing as group consciousness? Um, well, the kind of consciousness that we study and that we're focusing on, I would say no. It's a construct of a brain it's in our minds and uh it's a way of it's a simplified way of understanding complicated beings and it's um con constructed in here uh there's it's not an emergent property across groups of people if you have one person and you put him on an island all by himself he's still conscious and he can still think about other people being conscious even though he's all alone as long as his brain's intact so uh 
in that sense, no. I think socially we do have uh, emergent properties. All kinds of interesting things emerge out of um, groups of people interacting with each other. But this thing that we talk about as consciousness, I would suspect is mostly not at an um, emergent group level. It's mostly, you know, in each of our, our brains. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you think that science will ever be able to solve what is called the hard problem of consciousness? That is, we have uh, the soft problem, I think, that is just identifying the areas of the brain that uh, show some sort of activity when we're experiencing consciousness or people report that they are experiencing consciousness. But then there's the other part that is, how do we get from that activity to the phenomenon of consciousness itself. Right, yes. I think uh, it is already essentially solved. I think there's a, uh, at least the, the overall concept of it is there. Uh, there's a, a, a growing uh, perspective on consciousness. Essentially that, um, as I sort of hinted at along, along the way, we are information processing machines. I like to say the mind is a trillion stranded sculpture made out of information. It's constantly changing. It's gorgeously complicated. But everything you know or believe about yourself or the world derives from information in the brain, constructed in the brain. Everything derives from information. And we claim, we insist that we're conscious, that we have subjective experience. For the same reason we insist on anything or make any claim, it's because the information from which that claim derives is in there. Uh, so it's all about information. There is no reason to suppose that information is literally accurate. It's a pretty good kind of quick and dirty cartoonish description. This is why we go around talking about ourselves as having a, a, a mysterious inner experience. What's going on really is a machine that's building self-descriptions. And that is entirely understandable from an engineering point of view, from a science point of view. Uh, that's, uh, there's, no, there's no fundamental uh, mystery about that. So the hard problem uh, kind of goes away. I, I would just add, uh, so David Chalmers, who kind of popularized the hard problem, he has, he has this wonderful knack for naming things. And so he has this new name that he's come out with to kind of try to capture this movement in the field right now uh, of consciousness studies. And the new, tr uh, the new label he's come up with is the meta problem. Okay? And the meta problem is why is it that we think we have a hard problem? And the meta problem is answerable scientifically. You can explain why a machine thinks something is true, why a machine makes the claims it makes. And so we can now answer scientifically, we can answer the meta problem. And the answer is, well, uh, the, the, when we describe ourselves as having an inner subjective experience, that's probably not entirely accurate. We're, we're neurons computing information and describing ourselves in simplified ways. So now we have a good explanation, a good answer to the meta problem. And the answer is there really is no hard problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, and is there any possibility that, uh, for example, as our brains also create, uh, let's call them visual illusions, that is the way they represent things that do not really correspond to the things that exist outside in the world, that, uh, that perhaps as it creates those representations that function as illusions, let's call, it, uh, let's call them that, that consciousness could also be itself an illusion. Right. Many philosophers have proposed this term illusionism to explain consciousness. And that way of thinking is uh, very close to what uh, my approach is. And I think this is a growing consensus, that this is what's going on. I am not 
fond of the word illusionism. Uh, I think it it implies things or it suggests to people things that are probably not true. Because when you say consciousness is an illusion, immediately people think, well, an illusion is when an agent experiences something that's not true. Well, if consciousness is an illusion, then what is experiencing the illusion? It seems to presuppose a conscious experience. And so you run into problems which are caused entirely by the use of that word. But the concept underneath that, the people who call themselves illusionists, the concept they're proposing is exactly the same kind of thing that we're proposing that many other people are proposing. We are machines that think we are conscious and we, uh, by introspection, by cognition, accessing our inner deeper information, we cannot tell that we're just machines computing information because we're captive to the information that's in there. We tautologically, we know only what we know. <laughs> so that's the illusionist perspective. That's that I think is fundamentally correct. Uh, but I always caution that I'm not all that happy about the word uh, illusion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and is it that easy to study consciousness in other animals? Because I mean, at least in us, uh, we ourselves report that we are conscious, other people do the same and we share this through communicative language and things like that. But I, I mean, I know that there's a biological continuity through evolutionary processes uh, between different species and we also share the same brain areas with other species and things like that. But I mean, is it that easy to determine that just because we have uh, other animals might have activity in the same areas that in our brains are correlated with conscious phenomena that they also have those experiences. Right now, it's very hard to tell. Uh, it's an extremely fraught area of research and there's a lot of argument. Uh, if we're right, if this kind of uh, growing perspective uh, it turns out to be right, and I think it is, uh, then the, uh, in a philosophical sense, in an ultimate sense, you could in principle tell whether an animal uh, is conscious in the same sense that we are. We don't have the tools yet, but you could in principle measure the information in a brain and find out, is this a brain that thinks to itself, I am conscious? and thinks to itself, this is what consciousness is, I have it, right? Can we, uh, so in, in principle, if you can probe the information in the brain, you could find out whether uh, it attributes that property of consciousness to itself the same way we attribute it to ourselves. Uh, that's a matter of reading the specific information in the brain. And we're very far from being able to do that in any general sense. I mean, there's little bits of information here and there we can read from parts of the brain, um, like parts of the visual system. So we're talking some dim, distant future technology. But the point is that it's, um, it's a possible in principle to find out whether a particular brain or a machine thinks it is conscious in the same sense that we think we are conscious because uh, it, it's a matter of, of knowing what the information is uh, present in, in that machine. Mm -hmm. And are we also very far from being able to create a conscious artificial intelligence? Uh, right, another question that I'm uh, very interested in. Uh, I think we're not very far from building machines that just like us uh, are relatively socially capable that can that know what consciousness is and that can attribute it to others and that can attribute it to itself and in this sense are behaving just like us that have that have the same thoughts and self beliefs that we have in other words consciousness machines that are sure they're conscious just like we're sure we're conscious we're not i i think we're not that far from that uh, 
I do, I don't, it's very hard to predict um, the uh, technology, information processing technology, and artificial intelligence is moving at an unbelievably blinding, fast, exponentially exploding uh, rate. Uh, so, you know, it could be decades, it could be 50 years, uh, but uh, something like that I think is inevitable and it's um, uh, technically possible and it's probably not that far off. Mm -hmm. Good or bad. I don't know if it's good, but for good or bad. Yeah, yeah, that's a question for the philosophers, I guess. <laughs> okay, so just one last question, and I, I want to ask you this because the person I'm about to talk about is a compatriot of mine, Antonio Damasio. So I would like, like to ask you what you think about uh, his theory about how consciousness works and how it is built up from lower processes, that is from uh, information that the body collects from the peripheral nervous system up to uh, the structures in our brain that integrate all this information about the body's internal states, let's say, and then create emotions and feelings and then he adds up I think uh, memory to also create the autobiographical self, at least in humans. So what would you say about that? I think all of that is very important for the content, the stuff that is in our consciousness. Mm -hmm. But from the point of view of an engineer, if you built that machine, you would have a machine that could say, this is my arm. Uh, that thing over there is red. Um, I ate eggs for breakfast yesterday. But you would not have a machine. There's nothing in that description that gives you a machine that says, and I have a subjective experience. Right? So the Tononi's approach and many people's approach is this kind of emergent approach. If you pile enough information and you hook it all together, maybe, hopefully, some consciousness stuff will emerge out of it. And basically what I'm saying is that if you want a machine that thinks it's conscious and claims to be conscious and talks about consciousness, that's an extra piece that you have to build into it. Otherwise, it will never make those claims. Yeah. Or you cannot, a brain cannot put out a claim unless it contains the information on which the claim is based, logically. And so for us to think we're conscious and talk about our consciousness, there has to be something else. And this is where the self model comes in. The brain is, has to be able to construct on top of all that uh, wonderful, useful stuff that um, uh, Tononi talks about. The brain has to also be producing some kind of self model or self description that pulls it all together and says it all belongs in this thing, this consciousness thing, right? So we need the self model. The um, uh, kind of simplified model of what it means to focus on and process information. You need that in addition to all those other things building up. So I guess that would be what I would say, that uh, Tononi's approach is a part of the problem, but there's this other part of the problem that has to be added in there to make the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. But then you would agree that perhaps things like embodied cognition are also part of the picture? Well, yes. Uh, so of course. Um, so all these processes going on in there uh, are, are part of the picture, right? They're very important parts of the picture. But uh, keep in mind, a lot of that stuff is currently buildable. Like people know how to build sensors and how to build things that integrate information and how to build memory. Uh, but there's still this one extra piece that you need. You can build a very complicated, sophisticated machine that interacts and talks but doesn't know what consciousness is and doesn't ever think, oh, I'm conscious. You need the extra piece in order to, to give it that property. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the extra piece that we've been uh, focusing on it and trying to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Graziano, just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the Internet for them to get in touch with more of your work? Well, uh, I have a website. You can just Google me, uh, uh, Graziano 
I'm at Princeton, so Princeton Graziano will do it. I have a lab website that lists all my publications, all kinds of publications. Uh, and um, I have, uh, you can always check out, there's a wiki page uh, that lists uh, some of my uh, books. So uh, those would be useful places to go to. Do you also use Twitter or, or not? I, I don't use Twitter. I'm I'm a caveman or a Luddite or something. I can't stand Twitter, so I decided to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very well. Okay, so Dr. Graziano, it was a really pleasant conversation. At least I really liked it. It was a real pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you again for taking the time. Sure, thank you. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.